Hey guys, I'm talking to you today about my very first 40 day fast as a Christian. And so this video is going to be essentially like a testimony and it's also going to include some lessons I've learned as well as kind of like the focus of the fast more than anything and some of the things that I did that helped me get through it. So let's go. Okay, so I'm going to start with the testimony part. Um, just to be clear, a testimony is not about me and it's about him. It's about bringing glory to him and about bringing honor to his name. And so when I go through something like a 40-day fast or when you do that or when your church does or when anybody does, it is always a testament of God. It is not a testament of us. It is not a testament of like our effort level or how good and righteous we are as a product of fasting. Those things come from God as our source. So just want to start there. I am not boasting that I got through a 40-day fast. I am boasting on the fact that God got me through it. So when I came into the fast in the beginning part of it, I was not in a place where I wanted to fast at all, just to be clear. Um, I do it because I've gone through this process enough times with him to know that when he's prompting something, there's always a reason. And the best thing I can do as a child of God, as a daughter of God, is to heed when he speaks to me in those times. So I've never done a 40-day fast, so the idea of doing it, particularly around the holidays, doesn't sound really enticing to me, in all honesty, but again, um, felt him prompting me about it, and so I did it. When I initially started the fast, the word that I had kind of got from him was like it being a, a boot camp of sorts, like a spiritual conditioning is kind of my understanding of what this was going to be. And true to form, it really was. But in order for me to really understand what he meant in regards to training and conditioning, I had to really understand like what, what does it actually look like from a physical sense to be trained in a boot camp. And so I kind of you know, became interested to know from a military standpoint, because we do talk about spiritual warfare and we talk about training and conditioning our bodies for a battle. So in the physical, like, what does that look like? How does one condition themselves? And so it brought me into a lot of just different videos, training videos that soldiers endure and go through. And one thing that really stood out to me in this time is that when they're conditioning soldiers, they really ensure that the stress of the training conditions has the capacity to mimic what the soldiers will endure in war. So it's not like they're conditioning soldiers in such a way where it's like, we're going to take it easy in conditioning because like, we don't want to like overstress you so that like you're deterred from battle. It's like, no, I need to mentally, physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually prepare myself for conditions that are going to always push me to the highest capacity that I might have as a human being. I am not a soldier. Just to be clear, I have never been in war. I have a lot of respect for people who do that. But what I do as a profession is I work with people who are street homeless and who are living oftentimes in extreme forms of poverty within Canada, Toronto specifically. So I want to be clear that it's it's not that I'm completely unfamiliar with working in conditions where things can be violent or difficult or stressful. However, when God is trying to take you to higher levels of understanding of who he is, he's always going to bring you up kind of a notch from what you're normally used to. So 
although I would consider myself someone who is a trained crisis worker and somebody who can deal with emergency situations and be a first responder in many capacities to medical and um, you know situations that could be violent, I'm still somebody who's human, who's a human being, and who has the capacity to get worn down from you know multiple situations and a lot of different stressors. So going back to the like preparing myself as like the way the mindset of a soldier would be was like the understanding this is going to be difficult. I went into this fast with the understanding this was not going to be easy, and a lot of stresses were going to be placed on me at the exact same time with the intention to mimic what is coming in the future as someone who wants to be a soldier with authority in the kingdom of God. And I really want to emphasize that we really, as Christians, should be striving to exemplify not only what Christ embodied when he was on the earth, but also to maintain kind of a similar mentality about like, when we are suffering through things that the end goal or like the end product of that is going to be authority in the kingdom. I'm really interested in that. I don't actually want to spend my entire time as a Christian not being able to pray effectively, not being able to minister effectively, not being able to love effectively, not being able to forgive effectively, not being able to understand the word of God effectively. I have no interest in spending my Christian time on the earth living like that. So that was my foundation of this fast. Spiritual warfare, conditioning, and being ready to go to a different level in terms of authority, in terms of power, and in terms of, in terms of conditioning. So this really did push me in that respect. I did not do a water fast for 40 days, just to be clear. I know that is the fast that Jesus did, before his ministry started, that was not the fast that I did. I personally do not feel ready for that quite yet. So the fast that I did was doing one meal a day. Um, I typically did this around lunchtime, lunch, dinner time, depending on my work schedule as I'm a shift worker. Um, and I would say that it really, I had to be flexible about the times that I would eat. So it wasn't always like I could eat at two o'clock in the afternoon or 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Sometimes I was eating at 2.30, sometimes I was eating at seven, um, but it was consistently one meal a day. Um, and so I guess to maintain the component of like a testimony and saying what God did in that time is he not only true to form, conditioned me to a point where there were many different challenges that were happening at the same time, including family challenges, including things that were happening at work, um, transitions at work, things that were happening in school, things that were happening in my student placement. All of these things were kind of happening at the same time. And on top of that, I was really experiencing a lot of difficulty sleeping. So it was, it was almost like all of the stresses in my life increased. And on top of that, I was not eating anywhere near as much. So I was definitely like losing weight. Um, and I was also in the same process, like really struggling to sleep. So I was very sleep deprived <laughs> through most of this fast. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. And I would say that um, it definitely, really showed me that when I have a lot of different stresses happening on top of me, it really showed me a lot of the anger that was still inside of my heart that I had kind of really suppressed. Things that maybe happened in childhood, things that I had not been present were still there. Those things surfaced in that time and really genuinely surprised me. A lot of pain that I had dealt with from past experiences, both um, as a non-Christian and as a Christian, things that were confusing and difficult. At this time, a lot of that stuff was coming to the surface through these multiple stresses that I was experiencing at the same time. And I think something that maybe many of us can understand about fasting is that the more, the more stresses we put on the human body, 
the more we have the capacity for our emotional stability to kind of shift, right? So like, it's one thing to be sleep deprived and go to work, right? But you know, you can get a coffee later, you know, you can have a snack later, you know, you can do things like watch a movie later, or spend time with your friends, you know, you can do those things later. But when you continue to layer on more and more stress, you'll notice that naturally, like, you start to feel more cranky, you start to feel more irritable. And those things start kind of coming up that maybe you thought were gone, but in truth, it just needed kind of the right opportunity to expose itself. So when I think about, again, the the foundation of like conditioning oneself and um, conditioning, well, I mean, like the Lord conditioning me through this, it really, again, had to mimic the fact that, you know, within this Christian walk is that oftentimes we will lack stability in the physical um, in terms of like we may not always have the time to get what we physically want all the time but there still has to be in in essence inside of us a stability in how we are able to manage all of the things that are happening in our life so what i can say now (laughs) i know it's a little vague the way i'm explaining it but what i can say now has come out of this fast is I have seen the fruits of the spirit growing in a way that I I can't even describe for you. So I'm going to put them on the screen after I stop the shot, but I am going to just reiterate to you, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control, faithfulness, um, I'm probably missing more, but these are the ones I've got. I'm telling you, it was almost like these these fruits of the spirit were growing at such rapid rates. And it the like I can't even I can't even explain to you how much joy has come out post fast. It didn't really feel like it when I was fasting. Um but now I'm a few days past it and I'm going through some some difficult personal circumstances, including the loss of a family member who I love dearly, loved dearly. And yet there are these, these very tangible fruits that are there that I cannot even say like, oh, they're not present or I, I'm not aware of them or I don't notice them. It's like there's just this this joy that just doesn't go away, you know, and it, it has absolutely nothing to do with the circumstances that are happening around me. It's just like you just you can't touch it. You can't take it away. I don't care what is happening in my life. There is still this this deep, profound satisfaction and joy that comes from knowing my relationship and my foundation in Christ. And I, I'm not going to do a very good job at explaining it, but what I can say is that it has been just such a, a present help when I'm going through difficult circumstances in my life is to just have that security and knowledge and knowing that there's always someone I can fall back into when those things are happening. And that joy just really cannot be suppressed by circumstances. Um, love definitely very present right now. I would say that that's something that I'm noticing is it's like an even deeper understanding of love. Um, and his presence, it is so, it is so tangible to me, his presence right now. It's like I can't even. Like, you know, when you hear people say things to you, like, I don't know what God sounds like. Um, like, what would he sound like? Or I don't know what he's saying right now. Like, he is so loud to me right now. I cannot even pretend like, oh, it, it's I don't hear him or I don't. He is so close to me right now. Um, and even going through you know, such a devastating loss in our family. I just, I am so loved and cared for in this time and I am so aware of it. And I think that's a really important distinction is like it's really easy 
for us to read scriptures and say, well, God is a present help. God is my refuge. God is my shield. The Lord cares for those who are brokenhearted. And it is very different to feel it and to know it. Like there's one thing to understand it and there's another to experience it. And I'm experiencing it in a way I've never, ever, ever experienced in my life. Um, so those are some of the things that have come out of this fast. And I would definitely say that something that has been a really important thing for me in terms of who I want to be as a person is I really want to have, I really want to have the character that God exemplifies for us to be able to be patient with people, to be loving with people, not to be rattled by things people say or do, not to be in a reactive state when someone says something, to be able to hear and see beyond it. God does that with us all of the time. Like Jesus is our is our counselor. He is our ever-present help. And to have um, a character that slowly grows more into something that you could say, you know, whoa, there are moments where I kind of sound like you, or there are moments where I kind of act like you. It's very exciting in all honesty, especially when you, uh, much like myself, have come from a place where you were never like that before. Um, and I, if you don't really know what I'm talking about, you can check out my testimony video um, where, I, where I talk a lot about, you know, using drugs and drinking, having really significant mental health issues at particular points of my life, um, going through being homeless, going through a lot of different things that always resulted in and exemplified a very chaotic character inside of myself and to to be in a place in my life where there is like a genuine stability in my character and again I don't want to I don't want it to be like I take credit for that I'm not taking credit for that because I didn't have that before Christ so I know where it comes from and I know that's not a product of me that's a product of him working inside of me but it is something I am so eternally grateful for. And, and if you're kind of wondering like, hey, like, why would that even be that important? Why would that even really matter all that much? I have to say to you that it makes life extremely, I don't even know. Like, it's like you have this capacity to choose things so differently because you have a character that is stable, when you're in a place where you're always reacting to everything, you really are at the kind of at the mercy of your body and of your emotions and of people around you. But like, there's something about how they describe God, like God's character is the same from the beginning to the present to the end. He is constant. He doesn't change. He is unwavering. He is unmoving. He is faithful, even when we are faithless. So to be able to start to develop a character that is constant, that like, even if you're mean, even if the person in front of me is disrespecting me, even if the person in front of me um, visibly doesn't like me, even if the person in front of me is abusing their power over me, to be able to maintain a sense of character and who I am and not be pulled into those situations in such a way where I feel like I lose respect for myself because I reacted to your, your actions or I reacted to whatever. To be able to like legitimately say that like I forgive you and oh that was such like that was such a testimony to this fast to you to be able to to develop a sense and an understanding. I don't want to say like in a really, in a deep way, but to really start to hit the surface of understanding forgiveness better. And what does that look like from a fundamental perspective? How do we actually learn to forgive in a way where we, um, we aren't taken out of character and we're also someone who can continue to bless and not curse people when they are doing something that really hurts us at our very core level. And that was also part of the fast, was really starting to understand that better. 
And I'm definitely going to link some videos in the description about what I did and what I watched in order for you to see some of the resources that I utilized. So that's it for testimony. I'm going to move into the next section now. Okay, so lessons that I learned beyond kind of what I reviewed in the testimony. Obedience. This is a a lesson I feel like we have to keep learning and relearning. And I think sometimes we think like, hey, like I kind of have figured out this subject matter. Like I, for, I figured out how to be faithful. I figured out how to be humble. I figured out how to be kind. And I, and I really want to challenge that perspective that God's really never interested in like a singular definition of a word. It's more like a process where you deepen your understanding progressively and you also understand how it layers into your your life. Like it's not just something where it's like, okay, I figured out obedience. Hey, I just figured this out. It's like, no, he's interested in bringing you into a fuller revelation of his, his kingdom, of his principles, of his values. So I had to really look at the fact that my obedience was very contingent on, I guess, more or less like what was at stake or what, what was invested in a situation. I can be obedient if it's something I'm comfortable being obedient in. But as soon as I got to a place where it was something where I, someone, someone was really near to my heart, my obedience faltered. Um, and I had to really look at the fact that like, I really wasn't trusting in, in a very, um, I wasn't trusting him. And I, and it was really dependent on how confident I felt in an area. So obedience was definitely part of the lesson. I would say like number two is redemption. That is something that he continues to show me over and over again is how he redeems stories, he redeems time, he redeems circumstances, he redeems people. He is the author of redemption and that is something that is so near to his heart. And I think we need to really consider how when God chooses people or you know brings people into the understanding of who he is, he always plays like the long game. It's never a short game with him. He's never like, oh, you know, I'm going to pick someone who, you know, makes sense all the time to save. It's like he, he often sees the people that we don't see. And that has definitely been my story. And he just continues to remind me about his redemptive abilities. And oftentimes he challenges me to realize like, Elsa, if something is still broken or feels unresolved, it's not done and it's not over. I still have the final say in all of that. And that's something that can be hard to understand, especially when it's areas that we feel very vulnerable in. There are certain areas that I'm very uncomfortable giving to him. But there are times where I actually let him come into specific parts of my heart. And I would say that the redemption that he creates in those scenarios is always far better than anything I could have conceived myself. And I, I never really have to do all that much anyways. <laughs> so that's kind of like, you know, something to just maybe remind people who are listening is that if you feel like there are parts of your story that are right now are, are not, they are in a place where they're broken and fractured, just remember that he still gets the final say in all of it. And sometimes it's just a setup for an opportunity in the future that will bring glory to him in a way that you cannot even conceive. And this, and this happened to me 
within the past few months as well, where I really saw some of the the redemptions that happened, where it, it made me not only have um, a more grateful heart when those things did come, and I, th I think that's something that we really need to remember is he's very focused on stewardship. And so sometimes he will let you go through some tough lessons so that when you are stewarding something, you will handle it with care and gratitude. You know, if you're not going to look at it as just something that like he owes you. And... Um, Forgiveness, I mentioned that one was a really, really, continues to be a difficult lesson, but a valuable one. And I think just having a better understanding of myself, I think that's always a really remarkable piece of fasting. And I'm not, I'm not advocating for it for specifically that reason, but I don't think there are too many mirrors that can really reflect to you quite what fasting can. And what I mean is, is that it's really easy to seem like a nice person, to seem like a good person, to seem on the surface that you're doing all of the right things. But when you, when you are willing to sacrifice and give up some things, you will be surprised at specific points about what it reveals in you. And I don't mean it's necessarily always a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes what you'll realize is that it's it's kind of just like an unhealed trauma. And that was something that really happened to me in this fast was certain things that I thought I understood about myself. And, and I had very much a lack of empathy around those areas like it was more of a frustration with myself like why can't i be better in this area why is it i just can't get my stuff together in specific stuff and and he really showed me in that time with such like kindness this is an area elsa that you are still very much wounded in and it just needs healing. That's it. And it's not something that you have to be judgmental with yourself. And it's not something that you have to be harsh with yourself. And it's not something that you can just keep projecting impatience into. You know, sometimes one of the greatest gifts that we can learn is how to allow him to love us in such a way that we learn to love ourselves too. And it really makes it so much easier to love others. And I've said this in previous videos, the concept of like loving the Lord, loving yourself and loving others, they just, they have to flow into one another. They don't, they don't happen independently. And before anything else, it's you and God. And that love is the one that trickles down to people. Um, so I'm not going to advocate that you must love others more than yourself. I will always say that the thing we need to understand about how you love others the way you love yourself, it really comes down to letting him love us, loving him. And in that, between that exchange between me and my God, that can flow into how I love others. And it just cannot happen when I ignore myself. And I say this as somebody who works in the helping profession, because I've been burnt out and I have had compassion fatigue and I've had all of those occupational hazards that come from trying to care for others before myself. And I promise you that is a way to have a really miserable, mean and unhappy caregiver. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, so strategies that help me. 
I've mentioned them in previous fasting videos, so I would check those out if you want like basics about starting fasting. But in terms of this particular fast, I always, 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 always sit down with my calendar and I plan my fast. I do not ever arbitrarily just pick a fast on a random time unless I am prompted by the Lord. So if the Lord says to me, I need you to fast for these three days, I will. Otherwise, I am sitting down with my calendar and I am looking at my life and I'm saying, what is the time which can maximize the opportunity that I can spend with him while I'm fasting? Because even though, you know, COVID is still doing its thing, I am still working full time. I am still doing my master's and I'm still doing my placements. So time is of the essence to me and I, I really have to think ahead. So planning, really important. Um, I would say that a strategy that really helped me is, is breaking my fast not at work. <laughs> like this sounds really simple, but what I found is that when I was focused sometimes in, the, in previous fasts on bringing food to work, like unless I was doing like a, a Daniel fast or something, if I was focused on, you know, breaking my fast at work, oftentimes what would happen is there was just so many um, potentials for, for things to happen at work that oftentimes it disrupted the time where I tried to just break it. So it was like, I guess what I'm saying is that there is obviously, there's still warfare that happens when you're fasting. And so I think it kind of minimizes, you know, how much the enemy can influence the times that you're breaking your fast. So what I would often find is like, I try to break at work and usually right before I'm about to break for my fast, an emergency happens at work. Or um, my boss is like, you can't take your break right now or, you know, the fridge breaks down. Like there's, there were so many things that were happening on a regular basis when I would try to break my fast in a public setting. And I just found it so much more simple to make sure I, you know, I either ate when I got home or ate before I went to work. And then the rest of the time where I was not going to be, um, that I'm not breaking my fast like while I'm at work. It gives me time to read scriptures. It gives me time to leave and go for a walk and meditate on God's word. And then that way it's just far more simple and less opportunities for any kind of chaos. And what else? Um, okay, <laughs> this is a really simple tip, but something that actually really helped me a lot. One of the difficulties I faced during this fast was when I would break my fast, I would experience extreme forms of tiredness because my body was, I guess, had gotten used to periods of like not eating for extended periods of time. And so my body was mimicking certain, you know, if you look into things like intermittent fasting or a lot of like research around stuff like that, there, there's a lot of science I know, like, it's, it's logical, but it just wasn't in my head when I was doing this, is that there are things that happen to your body when you go through periods of fasting. And so one of the things that I learned in this fast is that when you are fasting, you are very sensitive to sugar in your blood when you break your fast. And so things like insulin, you're more insulin sensitive, I've learned. Anyways, so <laughs> very simple strategy. If you are doing a one meal fast or you're doing a 12 hour fast, apple cider vinegar in a cup of water before you eat. And then that way I was not tired and I was functional and I could legitimately break my fast, eat and continue through my day without needing to take a nap or feeling the itis after it. So again, simple, but sometimes there are physiological things that may happen to your body and there is no harm sometimes in just like looking into how you can mediate that. And I actually found that extremely helpful because I, I don't want to be like constantly needing to sleep, especially if I have to go to work. 
and I'm trying to cut down on caffeine. Also really important is remember that if you are changing your diet or you are eating less or any of those things, your body needs to adapt to it and it needs to go through a process of adaptation. I constantly ignore this when I fast, constantly. And I always am reminded very quickly that your body functions on homeostasis and you've developed homeostasis, which is basically your body's baseline. When you have a baseline for your body and then you do something that significantly impacts your baseline, everything gets thrown off. And so please be aware of this because it really makes a vital difference with things like coffee intake or how much sleep you might feel, even just your body temperature. There are so many things that kind of happen in this time. Like I'm telling you, I broke out like crazy. So it's just your body is trying to deal with the stress of the fast because you're, you know, when you're not eating, your body is going through. And I'm not saying I didn't eat at all, but if I try to overeat or binge eat, which I tried, it doesn't work very well. Um, it, because what happens then is you crash. You don't want your body crashing during the fast. The time is not to, I, you know, create more of an idol out of food. It is intended for it to be a sacrifice. So just remember that, pay attention, let your body take time to adjust. Pray and ask God if you need help with certain points. There are times where he would just give me little strategies that help me, um, including things like stop drinking so much coffee, also to compensate for your lack of food. <laughs> so um, obviously probably common sense to many people, but for me, again, doing sometimes shift work and school and all that fun stuff, I don't care. I needed coffee <laughs> in those times. So um what else? Eating balanced diet. Your your you know your body is trying to level itself out. You're eating less. Make sure you jam some nutrients in there. Like don't be eating crap. Again, learn that one again as well. Um, I'm doing these as really practical strategies because these were all things that helped me. Binge watch things like this. Believe it or not, this is why I'm doing this video is because I want people who are fasting to have an, another resource because when you're going through a fast, sometimes you need encouragement. You don't want to be, you know, running around talking to everybody about your fast. And sometimes just for me personally, watching someone else talk about the difficulties that they had or the struggles that they had or the time that they needed to just like focus and meditate on God and what they learned and how they grew and where they struggled. I found some great resources on YouTube, honestly. And in, in certain points where I was feeling discouraged and I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody about it, they were uplifting. So this is why I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm also prompted by God, but you know, this was this is a big motivator for me. And I think that's it. Um, I don't want to like bypass like the, the pivotal parts, which like are always part of fasting and say like, oh, I'm not like strategies. I wouldn't say like you want to obviously make sure you're praying. You obviously want to make sure you're reading your Bible. Do it literally as much as you can. That's it. Sermons, podcasts, things that edify your mind, read books. Um, take time to be quiet. Just sometimes you need time to just be quiet. And if you are someone who, you know, are you're usually caring for your family and you're busy with kids and all that stuff, if there's a way that you can, you know, take time to get away, go for, even just go for a 15 minute walk. Um, the Lord really capitalizes on those moments with me with walking. He always speaks to me in those times and always some very like formative lessons in those moments and journaling that's really helpful too i don't journal every day i'm not a, like a constant journaler but when i'm learning lessons or i'm struggling with things definitely use my journal a lot so my final thoughts now 
Okay, so final thoughts about the fast. I really want to emphasize two different types of fasts that you see in the Bible. Fast one being with the body of Christ, for example, your church, for example, a group of believers, but there are also examples where people fasted by themselves. You see Daniel do that, you see Jesus do that, and we also see Paul describing that he was fasting often, and we know that he traveled frequently by himself at certain points. So I am saying this with the intention to just remind people that I, I'm not diminishing the importance of fasting with your church, you know, in January because you're starting the new year off and you want to do it right. That's great. But the Bible also prompts us to fast often. Fast often. Uh, it's a really great discipline and it is something that when you are doing independently, is also something that you can really grow significantly within your personal walk with God. I will always, 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 always encourage people to fast. I literally think it is the secret sauce to Christian life. There is no greater way to have more time with him and for him to have more access to you. There is no better way and the most profound moments and revelations, I really, really believe they were birthed in fasting. They were birthed in times where, and I'm like, again, you can check out other videos I've done about fasting. I'm not an expert faster. I will never pretend to be an expert faster, but I have seen him move mountains because of it. I have seen him heal trauma like I I can't he has broken bonds like oh my god I can't even I don't even have words for how much he has broken off of my life even like oh like I'll give you an example guys I smoked for like 10 years I to this day I still think smoking is like logically like fun but he broke that off of my life. I don't even think about it anymore. I don't even like necessarily, it doesn't even come to my head. I don't, I don't like the, the, I'm emphasizing the fact that in my mind, I'm not like, I don't look down on smokers. I don't feel like, oh, I don't understand why they don't do it. I'm not that person because I used to love smoking. I'm telling you, there were times where I would smoke, smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, guys. Like I, I smoked a lot in periods of my life. And he last year just broke it. Like I'm telling you, I don't, I could be around it. And I'm just like, and it's like there, and even me and my sister, sometimes we will joke around about that. We'll be like, remember those times you used to smoke? And we're like, yeah. And it's like, but like neither of us want to do it anymore. Right. But so it's like, again, it's like this thing that ha we had like specific memories where we're like, yeah, I remember we used to do that. And it was something where there were moments where we thought it was like fun or like moments where we enjoyed doing that with like a coffee or a drink. And now I am so oblivious to any feeling or desire or anything like that. Like he broke it and I never, ever, ever thought I was going to stop. Never. No, even when I stopped smoking, when I got saved, I was still a stress smoker. So still you could get me at certain points. Like if stress was really bad, like things were really going wrong, you would still find me smoking at some point. And he broke it. I And I'm telling you, that was through, I believe, honestly, that was a fast. I believe he brought me to a circumstance in my life where I had a significant health problem. And my the person who was treating me said to me, you either stop smoking or you accept the fact that you are not going to heal. And I was so devastated by this. 
And that right after that, he took me into a month long fast and he knew how much I did not want to fast. I, the last thing you could have asked me to do, and I would have said, oh, let's fast now. I didn't want to do it. He kept pushing and he kept prompting me and just that little bit of energy that I had left to give to that, like I'm telling you when they when he, they describe specific points of like a mustard seed, like something so small, that's how I felt at certain points of my walk that I could give him, that I really didn't have a lot to give him. But those moments where I said, fine, I don't have a lot, but what I do have, I'll give it to you. And he, and like, like, I'm t- that like I'm emphasizing it so much right now because that's like how meaningful that was to me. It still is to me. It like it was something I just I was never giving up and it's gone. And it's been over a year. And it's like I don't even care. And I'm I'm around people just so you know, my line of work, again, I mentioned working with people who are street homeless. I'm oftentimes in the presence of people who smoke or who have lighters or things like in different capacities and different situations like that. And I never look at it with a desire to do it. And I give him thanks. So my final thoughts is just like fasting is something that is not always fun. It's not always easy. And there are times in the fast where I would give anything to break the fast. And there are times where I'll tell him, I told him in this fast, I'm breaking it. (laughs) Like I go through periods like that. Just so you know, um, I want to always be super transparent with you on this channel and never ever give you the impression that I don't go through similar moments where I'm just like, you know, this sucks, F it, I'm done. And to want to walk away from what I've promised or what I said I did, but his grace His mercy, his kindness always brings me back. I'm telling you, he always brings me to a point where I'm like, fine. And something miraculous always comes from it. And I want to emphasize the miraculous is not always about things that are like physically tangible. Like I got a car. Oh, I got this. I got that. No, sometimes the miraculous is to say goodbye to the sin that you once used to love. The one where you're like, oh, I'll never give that up. To watch him just break that off of you. Or to, I know some of you guys are dealing with things like anxiety and fear. Every day you deal with that. Every single day, especially in this COVID culture, they are selling fear like nobody's business right now. But to be able to say that you have peace, guys, peace, peace. Do some of you even know what that feels like? I'm telling you, there were times where I did it. There were times where I couldn't have even conceived peace. To me, I was like, what does that even mean? I know what it's like when I have a glass of wine. I know what it's like to have a drink. I know what it's like to have a cigarette and feel a moment of relief. I know what it's like to get into bed with somebody and have sex with them and for a moment stop hating myself. I know what those things feel like. I do not know what it feels like to experience peace. Now I do. I genuinely do know what it means to experience peace. And that only comes from God. That only comes through Jesus Christ. So I don't care what anyone else is selling you. I don't care whether they tell you this will make you better. This will make you happier. If you have money, if you have this, if you have that, great. How come then people who have everything go nuts? I'm sorry. I got to ask it. Why does that happen then? Why do they get to a point where they'll kill themselves? Why does it get to a point where they can't stop using drugs and alcohol? Why does it get to a point where they go bankrupt? Why does it get to a point where they will do something and overdose? How could it be that those things in the world will give you peace, will give you joy, will give you happiness, and yet you watch person after person after person who is visibly tortured by their life and they sell it as glamorous or something really exciting or exotic. 
I know that it can look like from a surface level that something like fasting or something like reading the Bible or something like spending your time on a YouTube channel talking about Jesus. Why would somebody do that? And I'm telling you, it's because it's that good. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't be on here talking to you if it wasn't that good. I wouldn't be trying to explain this to you if it wasn't that good. And I... And I, it's just, there's no way for me to really fully explain it to you until you experience the love of Christ. And when you experience that and you start to come from a place slowly, it's not an instant process. Don't believe the hype. It's not an instant process. I am not complete. I am still working out my salvation with fear and trembling. It is not completely over when you give your life to Christ, that is the start of salvation. You have so much more accessible to you. And when you give your life to Christ and you start to walk this thing out, I am telling you to come from a place of fullness inside, not from a place of empty, not from a place of anxiety, not from a place of fear, not from a place where I want to purchase my self-value or my self-worth. I'm not looking for any of those things from the world. I am looking for it specifically through Christ. And when he fills my heart and he comes into my life, I can operate in my life through fullness, through actually being who I was designed to be. And so those things in the world, they're not enticing. They're not interesting to me anymore. Does that mean that I'm not susceptible to be tempted by things like that? No, don't ever be arrogant enough to think that like suddenly you're immune from temptation. This is where people fall. This is where people are prideful. But what I am saying is that no temptation out there is better than what God gives you inside. And for those of you who are saying like, what's so good about what you get inside of your heart? I ask you, what would it be like to live your life without fear, without self-loathing, without that anger coming in every time you think you have it under control or falling into things that you keep feeling like you should be able to get out of that, but you can't. It's because you can't. You cannot get yourself out of it by your own strength. That is only going to come through God. It is only him that will break it off. Okay. So anyways, I really hope this encourages you. This fast has been incredibly impactful on me as a human being. And I really hope that it is something that from my testimony sharing this with you, that it encourages you to, to, to pursue fasting, to pursue living after how God calls us to live. There are so many fantastic scriptures in the Bible that will describe different types of fast. Please let the Holy Spirit be your guide. This, this beautiful Bible, guys, this book is alive. So it's not just like that I open it up and I'm just reading about really boring historical figures. And I'm just like, oh, wow, look how great they are. No. This comes into your heart and transforms you from the inside out. And I don't know, that sounds like, how does that even work? I'm telling you, it's worth trying. You've tried everything else. Is it working? Do you feel better? Do you feel more peaceful? Do you feel more joyful? Do you sleep with, with a lot of ease and know that like if anything were ever to happen to you that you wouldn't worry? Your family wouldn't worry about where you went? I think that's something we have to ask ourselves. And this is something I found myself asking other people, when I lost this family member, if you are so certain about where you are going, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid when other people go? If you knew you were going to, if you knew that they would go somewhere good, you knew you were going to go somewhere good. You guys, we have to start paying attention to the fact that God designed us in a very very specific, very particular matter, and we can recognize the truth. We don't like to hear the truth. We get offended by the truth. We have a very offended culture right now. But in all honesty, we were designed to know intuitively that God exists. 
the scripture says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everything on this earth, if you look close enough, that was made by his hands, it declares who he is, including us. We know intuitively the truth. And that's why you get really offended when Christians speak to you at certain points. I'm not saying all of them do a great job. I'm not even saying I do a good job, but I'm saying there is a reason that you get incredibly offended when a Christian speaks and there is something inside of you that does not want to accept the fact that what I am saying is true. You would rather walk in darkness. So I prompt you, I urge you, and I encourage you to move beyond that point and to just see what happens. Worst case scenario, go back, live your way, but at least try. I love you. Hope you have a great day. Bye.